it's going to go that way, right? Like nobody's nobody's just going to be like, well, I stole 20. Can I steal 30? They're going to try. Yeah. And then they steal 30. They're like, can I steal 40? Yeah. They're going to yeah. try, you know? Yeah, which is still- interesting because this gets to a whole thing of like, do people even fear God? You know, like I, I, I remember I said that so much over this this past year, you know, with some of the scandals that have that broke out among certain hierarchs and stuff. And you read the stuff, you're like, I, I mean, beyond the offense and beyond the and yeah. it sounds terrible beyond the offense and beyond people being hurt and all that stuff. I mean, I'm not making light of that at all, but literally I'm thinking to myself, like this person literally has no fear of God. Mm-hmm. Like they are, they are a functional atheist, you know, like a bishop mm-hmm. doing all kinds of great stuff. It's like, wow. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and Christ is born. Glorify him. All right, cool. So um, Nativity Fast is over. So with that being said, I'm here tonight to ask Cyprian and Father, in the spirit of giving presents and everything, what is the worst gift you have ever given someone? Just like someone opens it up and you just know right away, like, yep, this was a mistake. I shouldn't have done this. I got mine. Go ahead. So I don't know what happened, but a couple years ago, I got my wife No Doubt's Tragic Kingdom on vinyl. She's like never really listened to that album ever. And I was like trying to get her to explore stuff because she was wanting me. She was like, what's some stuff I should listen to? So I got it for her. Like, sure, it's a good album. Like, it's okay, I guess. Like, it's not really my thing. But I was like, oh, you know. She might be able to get into this and shocker. She never did. She opened it up and was like, thanks. Thanks. This is cool, I guess. And then that was that. Never. And then it went into the sub the subterrain and was never seen again. So yeah. That was that. Why would you even get that? I well, I remember it being a pretty good album. And not to be like that guy, but it's like a female vocalist. And my wife tends to bond a little bit more, not really, but a little bit more with bands with female vocalists, kind of. Okay. Like, like she likes like Chelsea Wolf and Emma Ruth Rundle and stuff. And mm-hmm. it's not really the same thing at all. I mean, no doubt's a far cry from yeah. Chelsea Wolf and Emma Ruth yeah, Rundle. But um, yeah. I don't know. I, I think, you know what I honestly think it was? This is me just fully being completely honest. I think I had something else in my shopping cart I wanted to buy for me in my Amazon shopping cart. And I was like trying to figure out a way to get it. I was like, okay, I'll just buy my wife this vinyl too. And so I bought it. And then I was just like, it. luckily it was like just for like, it wasn't like a Christmas present or anything. It was like an anniversary or something. It was like one of those things that's like, we never really go that hard on gifts. Oh, we could go with any gift here. I was thinking Christmas oh. gift. Oh, we no, no, no. Any, kind any of gift? gift you've ever given anyone ever. You just like did not, not even close. Well, I will say uh, the one that's coming to my mind was enjoyed by the person it was given to, but was not enjoyed by anybody else. And that was uh, two Christmases ago. I gave my older daughter, she was asking for a piggy bank. And I saw that they had a frozen, uh, frozen two piggy bank that lights up and then it, does the song Into the Unknown, which is like the song from, from from the Disney movie in like three different languages. And she really enjoyed it. But between her and my younger one, that thing, there was a period where Into the Unknown was playing nonstop, super loud on a loop because they kept playing with that thing oh, for like woof. two weeks. And I just about went insane. So I, I th- that one I regretted. <laughs> I definitely regretted giving, but uh, I think they enjoyed it but pretty bad wow. pretty bad it's it's up on a, it's it's far away up on a shelf now that nobody can reach it so 
Man. It's hidden. Yeah. I Ooh, I honestly I cannot think of anything. I and I'm not even part of the problem is that I think about this and everyone knows this. Like I I absolutely am in the negatives in regards of giving gifts. Like I I'm notoriously for not giving gifts. I don't give gifts. I don't do gifts. And it's not on any t- kind of deep level. It's just You just don't do it. Yeah, I just I'm a bad friend. I'm a bad husband, dad, friend, brother. I'm a bad everything in that. But it, it, in my mind, I'm like, well, I love on people all the time. So, yeah. <laughs> so I just but yeah, I'm I'm I I've I and I feel bad about it, but I kind of gave up because I've just I've never I'm not thoughtful like that. I'm just not. Really? Yeah. It's really hard to it's really hard to give people gifts. Like I, honestly, it's a diff the people who are there are some people who are good at it. Yeah. Oh like you're either good at it or you're not. I'm there's just some people who are really good at it. at it. You know who's yeah. really good at it? I got a goddaughter, Monica. She's she's got like a mutant power for giving gifts. She's got yeah. really, really, really good. Uh and what you would call it's really good too. My wife, she's really good at giving gifts, but She's good at being resourceful and then um, her ninja power of never knowing, like you just, she has a way of surprising you. But yeah, I, I have like, it's my kryptonite, man. I mean, I'm, so just for everyone, just don't ever, it's not because I don't love anybody. Just, I don't, I don't give gifts. I just, it's, it's a weird thing with me. I never have. And I'm just. You know. What was the worst gift you ever got then? Do you know that? Yeah, I've got some stinkers, but um, oh, man, uh, I don't know. I have to come. I mean, I can't ever recall looking at a looking at a gift and just thinking to myself, "This is the worst gift." I just can't. I I can't. Yeah. I think that would stick out to me if it had ever happened. It's my kryptonite. I just gifts and ju- I can think of good gifts, but like I. I'm just the gifts are gifts are I don't know I love gifts I love receiving them but it's I don't know forgive when me. I was growing up my mother was notorious and I thought that this was normal I thought everybody's mother did this but she was a teacher mm. and she was a part of like all kinds of different um, organizations and whatnot and the thing that she would do is pretty much whenever she received a gift she would put it into she had this giant box of gifts that she had been given and then she would just re-gift it yeah so like whenever whenever there were, <laughs> i remember so many times going in and be like mom mom i need to get a gift for somebody she'd be like wait wait let me get the get the would they like this would they like this oh i got this from something would they like this and then she'd wrap it up she was an amazing gift wrapper like she had that perfect skill oh, and then she would man. wrap it up and be like okay here you go and she just re-gifted she's she oh, was a, she was amazing That's at it, great. amazing at the regifting. That's yeah, great. buddy, That's buddy, and I, I I think I do recall once or twice where she came home from something, and she was laughing and said, um, "You know, I I messed up and I gave so and so the gift that they gave me two years ago. I Ooh. actually regifted." Oh, now that sounds. That's a bad. That's a whole Seinfeld episode right there. <laughs> They're like, "Isn't this the gift I gave you two years ago?" Ouch! That's rough. <laughs> that's rough. Yeah, that's rough. Pretty funny. My wife <laughs> actually funny. bought me um, in the Killing Fields, um, and that's good. But she thought it was a World War One book, and it's uh, not. It's definitely about like uh, Pol Pot and his whole thing. Mm-hmm. So, Cambodia. Um, yeah. Is rough, so um, yeah, that's a real downer. That's a real downer of a book, and not like World War One is super uplifting. I couldn't hear you, Cyprian. Oh, my daughter's running around over there. Oh, gotcha. Um, but that and but that wasn't the worst gift I've ever got. It was actually like still pretty cool. But um, okay, so we talked about last time that we were gonna do some audience questions, and luckily. You guys are awesome, and we have some audience questions. So, ooh, <laughs> sorry, these are from a couple months ago. 
This one is from November 9th. From Travis. And I'm just going to say, I apologize. You know, I know I'm behind on this. And there's a couple of guys, a couple of you guys that I've been keeping up correspondence with. And we just got done with our nativity fast. And it was kind of, you know, like, um, not to be that guy. It was a little intense. And checking email, it should have been more of a priority for me, but it wasn't. I apologize for that. So there's a couple of you guys that it's been a couple of weeks since you've heard anything from me. And I apologize for that. So that being said, we're going to move on. Um, so this is from Travis. Um, it is mentioned a little while ago, we talked about, uh, asking God to close doors. Um, basically Travis is kind of wondering if that works well for discernment, kind of getting wanting to get more details about that. It is only, is it only useful in the context of a difficult uh, decision? Is it only useful in the context of uh, of a difficult decision where you don't know what option is best, or can it be applied to avoiding temptations as well? Is it recommended to specify specific doors that you want God to close, or is it better to broadly ask God to close whatever doors he sees fit? So kind of looking to kind of double down. I think it's an excellent question. Like, Great question, yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, I imagine it applies... Anytime it's, you know, engaged with faith and not superstition, you know, and not mechanistically like magic, you know, um, you know, I have found and that's where, you know, it comes from is my experience of, of just, you know, seeking and, and trying to discern things, but difficult decisions, you know, um, I, I find that specificity is never needed for God. It's needed for us. You know, God understands everything. And I would say ultimately, you know, always asking for God's will, but asking that with a, um, with a manly intent, you know, because sometimes we say like, Oh, I want God's will. And you don't really want God's will. You're just saying that because you think that's what you're supposed to say. Yeah. Um, but I think if you can get to a place where truly you recognize if you ask for God's will and what is going to be beneficial for your salvation and to his glory, then whatever comes, that's what it's going to be. And accepting that, you know, is, is the key. But closing, asking for closed doors. And I'll, I'll just explain just to kind of, if people aren't, have never heard me talk about that before, you know, the, the understanding and the experience behind it is, people will often ask for like, you know, opportunities and, and for God to show them the thing that they should do. But I find that that's problematic because in many ways, the way temptations can often work is with a perceived abundance of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that that's what kind of confuses and complicates and conflates cer certain situations with other things. And so by asking God to just kind of close the doors that are not blessed or not, according to his will that will not be beneficial for our salvation it really helps to give you that insight and to to discern okay well this is obviously like what's left all these other ones have closed so i can trust that these were not going to be beneficial for me um and then you just move forward with courage yeah i mean that when i was getting ready to go back to school on father's recommendation and that was something that I constantly asked God to do because there was an abundance of opportunity. You know, there's like, well, what do I do? What do I go back to school for? You know, how do I do it? And when do I do it? And all this different stuff. And like, then upon even getting like into school, I thought I could take this math class that I could not. And I literally had to go back to my guidance counselor and be like, look, is there a dumber class I can take? Like, I need something that's not this advanced and that was another time where it was just like, no, that door is closed for me. And then like COVID happened. And then they're like, do you feel like COVID as a, do you feel like COVID caused you to fail this class? I'm like, yes, it was definitely COVID that made me, <laughs> that, that made me fail this class. And they're like, all right, well, we'll get you your money back. I'm like, sounds great. So like, that was another one of those opportunities of like, which was so weird because like, um, I was so intent on passing that, you know, it was like, I had to pass this class. 
I'm just totally running into a brick wall and falling down and getting back. I'm just running into the brick wall and falling down again. Meanwhile, God's like, hey, there's this whole door over here you could go through if you wanted to. So, um, but I, so I, I kind of thought maybe Travis didn't, wasn't asking that, but like, I, I don't know, like, so if like a guy was like, because I know you can get into superstition pretty quickly, but if a guy was like, if you don't want me to go to this pornography store, my car won't start or something. And then the car starts and then they're like, well, I guess I'm going, you know, like, yeah, I think no, that's you need, to, you need to watch out for lightning strikes on that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, that's is... that's magic. That's trying yeah. to do magic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like it, it's definitely about there's there's life decisions. You know, it's not about um, should I have Chick Fil A or KFC today? It's like you know we should be very careful not to, um, you know, and I think part of the thing to understand is. You know, people need to realize God's not interested in puppets. God doesn't want, that's part of the problem is that people want God to puppet them and, you know, to take away their free will. And it's, that's offensive to God, you know? So, um, yeah, no, it's not, it's not about that at all. It's about when there's a genuine, it, the key to prayer is always intention and authenticity. Even if you are wrong, being honest in that intention and honest in that area. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing to do, you know, what it's, would be like an example of that? Well, I mean, honestly, um, you know, there's been times when I've, I've had people, you know, they will engage in some sort of behavior or they'll have like a perspective on something and it's wrong. And they, you know, like many of us, we are all tempted with justifying something. And I just try to get people to understand, like, look, it's fine that you're doing this in the sense that, you know, God can work with an honest sinner, right? Like, God can save the sinner you really are versus the saint you're pretending to be. Okay. So, you know, practice now because the last thing you want to do is when you are at the judgment is start justifying yeah and saying making excuses for all these things don't do that just learn to be like yes i did that yes yes forgive me yes you know and just be honest and own these things because that you know people do that in the confessionals i talk a lot about this in, in catechism stuff but it's like don't do that don't don't justify yourself in confession because the confessional is a mini judgment so just learn to be honest about what's there. And even if you're not sure, it's better to defer in humility than to try to justify in, in ignorance. And excuse me, it, than justify in hubris, you know, and just be, I think, I think, I think I made a mistake here, you know, and, you know, I just assume I did, I need correction, you know. Isn't there like a kind of like a word by a father that's not like, canonical or whatever but it's something about like there might have been even a chance for like adam to repent before he turned around and blamed it on eve like he would if he had just been like when god was like did you eat yeah i mean he was like yeah i, I did i messed sure, up for sure adam for sure that's the thing adam could have repented for sure yeah i mean isn't that kind of the actual original sin is the, is the bl is the passing of the blame the and not taking the that responsibility yeah it well Yes, and even, excuse me, you know, <laughs> it's, it's tough for people to hear this, but, you know, not heeding. Because he, because Adam basically was not obedient. You know, he didn't heed God's command. And, and so he allowed himself to be misled by his wife. And, and then, of course, blaming it on her. You know, so we all do well, it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on, on this note, it's interesting because on this exact note, because when I had, you know, the a certain degree of celebrity that I had, and certainly in Vegas, you know, when I was on TV and my show was in Vegas and like what it's interesting, I, I always had felt that I kept relatively sober about like the celebrity stuff as relatively. Right. Mm -hmm. I definitely was not sober, uh, clear, like uh literally or figuratively during that period of my life, far from sober, but as compared to like my co-stars who was which is all i had to compare it to and as i compared it to other like vegas celebrities right mm -hmm. like 
because that's a whole other world of like you know people who like Penn and Teller, right? They're like Vegas celebrities, you know what I mean? Or like, yeah. what, what was the the guys with the uh, Siegfried and Roy? You know what I mean? That type of thing. And it, I fell into that. And one of the things that I would tell people is like, well, you know, I, I try to be sober about it, but it opens a lot of doors, I would say to people, you know, and I would say it as though that was like a good thing. But when I look back, all the doors that it opened were all doors that were... I could basically like feed my ego, mm. mostly feeding my ego, mm. you know, like it would open doors for me where I would walk into something and someone would like do a deal for me to do something to make my own vodka. I mean, I had my vodka company. Was, was I not a celebrity? There's no way that the distiller would have like been as interested in working with me mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, there were, there was just so many times when that happened. And at every single step, if I look back, it's like, the opportunity cost was really the one thing that I didn't do during that period that I was actively not doing because all of these other doors, it was because all of these other doors were open. And I was like, well, I could always go back to this is what I'm really good at, really competent at, and what I love to do, which is software. Mm -hmm. Like I did no software during that period of time. And it, and it's interesting because now being away from that, being a professional, being in like, I love doing software before. That's why I became a professional developer. I love doing software still. I knew I loved it at that time. I actually can help people with it. And I, you know, and I build things that are actually like useful for people and help people in the things that they do. And I get a great sense of fulfillment from doing those things, from building things and being able to look and say, ah, oh, yeah, I love that that's built and it feels good. Like, wow, that's great. It's a positive thing. And yet here I was chasing oh, I'm not supposed to maybe be doing that because all these doors are open. And it was like, well, dude, these doors aren't going to be open forever. You should just take the opportunity and go in. And so like, I really, really get asking. I, I, I wish that I would have, well, I, I mean, maybe not because maybe I wouldn't be here right now, mm -hmm. right? But it's like, yes, to have, to have understood, to have understood, you know, close like doors closed mm -hmm. may actually be the thing mm -hmm. that open door is not necessarily good even if it's a door that's not open for everybody else just because it's open doesn't mean you should walk through it well i think there's a measure of maturity that's tough to to walk into in regards of like where we're at as a society because you know that sense of when a kid's like wants to stay up and do all the things I want to do all the things. I got to do all the things. I don't, I want to feel like I'm missing out. And that's something that can haunt people well into their, you know, years where they should be mature and well into the, what, what should be moments and times and um, periods of spiritual maturity. It can really, people can, can really be stunted because of that tendency of just wanting to do everything and have everything and, and not realize um, the value in simplicity and the value of, you know, less being more things like mm. that, you know? So. Yeah. Cause like during the fast, it felt like <clears throat> for the first time in a while, I was like, I liked, and I, I, I guess, uh, the finer things of life, I suppose is what you call them, you know, like, like meat and whatever, I don't know, whatever. I was like in the in the proper way. Like it's weird how like when you hone in a craving for that thing correctly, it's like, oh, I love it correctly. Like because like I don't even need to go indulge it right now. Like I love a good burger, whatever. And you're like, I really, really want that. But you're like, no. And it's like it's weird because it almost like lines up in a way. It's like, okay, for once, and it's probably gonna last a couple minutes, but like I love that thing appropriately. Because it's like, it's, I love it in a measure that's like, I'm not obsessing about it. I'm not going needing to get five cheeseburgers or whatever to like try and fulfill it's this another. Yeah. 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 And so then I had to ask father, how do you feel about um, coin tosses? Like sometimes oh, I make decisions. Oh, a lot is cast into the lap and it's every decision is from the Lord. Okay. All right. All right. I'm, all, I'm all, obviously I'm all about it. So. Yeah, no, no, I I use it a lot. I do, and yeah. usually for pretty. I used minor. to have an app actually, 
my it drove my <laughs> drove my wife nuts. But I have an app of like the coin, you know, flipping whatever. I was like, sure. if I stop carrying change. I was like, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually nothing. It's probably too that's probably actually better. Actually, random number generator. No, it's probably probably way better, way better, like way more pure, it. way more pure random. Yeah, yeah I didn't mind it. But yeah. <laughs> Lot, lot, <laughs> every decision's from the Lord. All right. So then this next one is kind of a long one, but I'm going to try and cut it down a little bit. But um, this is again from Preston from November 26th. Uh, so Preston is wondering. Um, so there's this episode of John Hears W A W T A R podcast. Mm -hmm. um specifically the idea that ancient peoples could hear and interact with god and or other spiritual entities in a way that modern enlightenment influenced new world people are struggling to and are unable to access and the parallels between this idea and julian jane's idea of the uh bicam bicameral mentality father are you familiar with this term am i i know i'm butchering how to say it but like uh B I C A M E A R L by Camerol by Camerol. Thank you. I, I know the term, but I don't know. Hold on. Let me. Well, yeah, I'll let me keep get going. The Does he have the definition in there? Um, No. I'm oh bad. yeah. By Camerol. That's weird. By Camerol is yeah. That's where I've heard it is like legislature, like the house and the Senate. Does hmm. he, does he go into it deeper? So here let's, let's, let's. Oh, finish. the mentality. Hypothesis in psychology and neuroscience, which argues that the human mind was operated in a state. Hold on. I'll read the whole thing. Bicameral mentality is a hypothesis in psychology and neuroscience, which argues that the human mind once operated in a state in which cognitive functions were divided between one part of the brain, which appears to be speaking, and a second part, which listens and obeys the bicameral mind, and that the evolutionary breakdown of this division gave rise to consciousness in humans. This term was coined by Julian Jaynes, who presented the idea in his 1976 book, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, wherein he made the case that a bicameral mentality was the normal and the state of the human mind as recently as 3,000 years ago, near the end of the Mediterranean Bronze Age. So I guess we don't have this, but there used to be one part which is speaking and a second part which listens and obeys. Sounds... I don't I don't know if I grasp that concept. I don't either. I don't think I I don't think I need to, but like I, I think according to this theory, we can't grasp grasp the concept, which is why I think that the theory is kind of silly. <laughs> because if you don't <laughs> have a, a bicameral point, mind, <laughs> how could you grasp what a bicameral mind is like? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Although I would swear that there is a part of your brain that is listening at all times because it's like those shower moments. We're like trying to think of an actor and then like three days later, you're taking a shower and you're something like, you know, Malcolm, John Malkovich, you know, like, oh my gosh, that's that guy's name. You know, like, so like, well, that's what they call the subconscious, isn't it? In well, sort of so is, psych is this... psycho analysis and whatnot, psycho Freudian, crap, like Freudian psychology. Yeah. But like, so is that, is this, is this stating that that doesn't exist? Like, you know, because it's like one of those things that like, Read You'll... this question again, then. What's the question? Yeah, read the whole oh, question. We're way <laughs> off topic. We're way off topic. I just want to talk about this really, really quick. But you know, when you're like in the supermarket and you hear like Kansas's dust in the wind or something like that, but you don't know you're hearing it <laughs> until you're out in the car singing it. And you're like, wait, where did I hear that song? And you're like, oh, it was in the supermarket. Yeah, like, where, I... where was that? Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, wait, it was back there. But anyway, <laughs> so we're going to yeah. go and jump back onto the question. But um, so basically... Uh, I think that this is far more important. episode. Uh, I think this is the most important episode of the podcast of John. Here's his podcast so far. I'm um, curious to hear what Father Turbo would say that this sphere of ideas is unorthodox and should be avoided. Or is it worth thinking about as we try to go closer to Christ in the 21st century America? Perhaps this request is too open in and perhaps the topic is not a good one for you all to cover. But I'm no trained philosopher, theologian, so I'm probably butchering the representation of these ideas. Um, so I basically think that there's this idea that uh the ancient peoples and i think that this is fairly standard you know like orthodox I, I do this i don't really want to talk about it until i watch the episode because there's, there's hey there's too much that isn't preston preston we'll be back 
We'll be yeah. back for that. Okay. Thank you for your question. It's an extremely interesting question. We should all probably get a little bit more knowledgeable before we tackle it. And Andrew should probably research these questions. A little you know bit what? More. That's a good move, father. That's a real, uh, that what you just did, that was very, very prudent. I just want to, I just want to note it because now I'm thinking like, no matter what the response is, if there's just going to be anybody who's watched the episode is going to be in the comments, like that's not what was said in the episode. You're not yeah. even addressing the thing you got. And it's like, okay, yeah. well, let's just watch the episode then. Let's yeah, just watch the episode. That was very, very, very prudent. So very prudent. Mr. John from December 7th, 2022. This is not a question, but he sent me something funny. I was going to say it, but remember that the, uh, remember that time where the prophet Elijah begged God to take his life. And then he took a nap and had a snack and things weren't quite so bad. Like maybe you need to take a nap and have a snack today. So I thought that was pretty good. Thank you, John. A nap and a snack. Has has that ever been the wrong move? Nope. You know? No, for Never. real. Never. Um, so, okay. Um, uh, I'm so sorry. Kavan, Kevin, I don't know. I don't know how to say your name. I'm so sorry, but Kavan or Kevin from December 17th or Kaven, maybe, maybe it's Kaven. I'm very sorry. I'm from Missouri. I'm very sorry. Um, Royal path. Okay. So what does joy look like in the Orthodox life? It being one of the fruits of the spirit as a more recent convert from Protestantism to Orthodoxy. I feel like I may have a misconception of what joy looks like. This is a two part or this is the first part. Okay, yeah. If you want to know what joy looks like, um, attend uh, a Lent. And when I mean a Lent, I don't mean like a service. I mean go through Lent mm. and do Lent. Fast. Um, confess. Really engage yourself honestly. Um, and, you know do the sacrifice of, of prayers that the church offers and the penitential readings and right about the third week of Lent, you start to feel a uh, bright sadness as the church calls it. Um, you begin to hear something in the very penitential um, quote-unquote vibe of the music and the hymns and everything and, and there's something that paradoxically begins to bubble up in you and then um, around Holy Week leading to Pascha you really begin to experience um, joy and it isn't happiness it isn't like I'm excited um, to get a cheeseburger I'm excited that the service is over because it's so long it's something else it's it, it feels almost akin to hope. It feels almost akin to hope, um, but there's a little distinction uh, between hope and joy. But uh, I mean, they're linked, obviously. But like, yeah, that's, if you want to know what joy is for us, you got to go through Lent um, and you got to experience that, um, including, you know, the right of forgiveness and just going through everything. And then, then you'll kind of get approximation of it. But you know, any any type of description I'll give outside of that experience is going to not only pale in comparison, obviously, but it could potentially um, set you up for not being able to actually experience joy in a certain way because, um, you know, the, the problem with clinical definitions often is that you know, definitely there's failure on my part because I'm not the best communicator, but then there's also um, a breakdown in between, you know, what's trying to be communicated and how you receive it. And so there's a whole slew of filters that you have that you didn't realize that you have. Yes. And so even like being an evangelical process and having baggage there and you may be in a certain point where you're struggling with certain things, you know what I mean? And just the interpretation, the potential to interpret it the wrong way is too high. So it's definitely worth it to not look for, not that I'm accusing you of doing that, but not look for like the cheap kind of answer and, and, and get excited about the challenge in front of you and being like, okay, let me experience it, you know, because these are things that are eternal. 
And these are things that are deep spiritual value. And so they have to be, you know, pursued um, with, they have to be pursued with, with a sense of sobriety and zeal. That means, you know, actually engaging it because none of these things that are of the value that I'm speaking of, whether they're eternal or whatever, they don't come cheap. Um, you can't just yeah. grasp them like information. So, but yeah, well, that's what I would say. And that's, <clears throat> I've heard a couple of people say, like a couple of Orthodox brothers say that like one of the things that they do like about the Protestantism is there's this like this like exuberance, there's this energy behind the things that they talk about. Like they talk about, oh God, it's so amazing. You like, and there's like this like energy. But is that real? No, I think that's my point. My it's point a, was, it's an act. It's an it's act, an act and it's it's emotional. And God is really really good when you have your first cup of coffee of the day. You know what I mean? Like, and you're riding that high. You know, you're riding that mm -hmm. first caffeine of the day. Like, of course God is good then. You know, but like, um, I would say that like yeah it's just more complete and the experience i have is is that like those those next couple of sundays after lent it's like some of the barriers to me like feeling and i don't want to say like happy or good because it's not really like really but like less troubled without a doubt like less troubled it's like i just like oh it's okay to feel this way it's okay to not feel as troubled right now because you know christ is risen so like you know things aren't as bad as they were so you know, Father, the way that you answered that, it really helped me to, it was really, it was really great. And maybe I just like got it for the first time, but it actually like started to unlock some like patristic, the way that, the way that the fathers will frame things because she asked you, or is it a she or a he, the person who asked? It was a she, right? Unfortunately, I don't know. Okay. So the, the questioner asked you, what does joy look like? But what you answered was, where is joy found? Mm -hmm. And like, that is so, it's so different. They're two different things because it's like, I don't need to, because it isn't about like, how am I going to describe to you what joy looks like? Mm -hmm. right like you have to experience joy so then like what it's really all about is like where is joy found but the same way that like the difference between somebody asking what does christ look like and where is christ found mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's just like i feel like the fathers are constantly talking about where I mean, christ is found yep yep yeah right that it's like drawing a map to, that it's about a map to him it's not about a portrait of him it's about a map to him Right. And that even the icon is a map to him. It's not a portrait of him. That's right. That's right. And it, it's it's tough because, you know, um, I think it's one of the things maybe people find value in our project is that there is a sense of just kind of discovering um, and that, gosh, everyone forgive me how cliche this sounds because it's not like this is a social media like community. But I think that there's something that happens. People enter into our dialogue and they they can recognize that there's just, you know, we're all converts in that sense. Everyone's a convert. Even, even the 23 year old Serbian guy who was raised in the church, he has to come to a point where he actually believes in Christ and not just because he's raised Serbian, you know? So we're all converts in that sense, but the conversation we're having so explicitly, you know, kind of rooted in that phenomena of coming to Christ in the church. And so it's great to be able to, um, no, kind of like absolutely. get a peek into these things, I guess, you know, so. Trying to find out how to pronounce the name real quick. I'm sorry. What are you doing like, over there? I'm I'm trying to find out how to pronounce. Well, AI how's it will help you. AI how's, will it not spelled? Help. how's it spelled? K-A-V-O-N. Kavon. 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 He's a famous baseball player. Spelled exactly the same way. Oh, okay. Kevin. So I, yeah. that's what I was trying to. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be not be rude. So, and I'm guessing there's a there's a great Key and peel speech. Have uh, uh, oh, skit. Have you, have you guys seen that one? Yeah. Where, <laughs> yeah. where yeah. he's in just the school and he's pronouncing all the names. And he's like, she's like, my name is, is uh, oh, that's a or great something one. like that. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. like, yeah. Trace, 
Trace. <laughs> She's like, Tra- you mean Tracy? That, that's a great. <laughs> like, it's so yeah. good. That was so good. That's a good one. <laughs> um. So Aaron. 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 My name is Aaron. A. Okay. A. Aaron. So so angry. Um. So then, Father. Also, this is a good one. Um. Fresh off the holidays. Uh, could Father share any wisdom about participating? This is still um, Kevin. Could Father share any wisdom about participating in day-to-day life with local family members, siblings, parents, whoever, who are Christians but are Orthodox, not supportive of Orthodox traditions, seem difficult to know where slash how to place boundaries specifically when you want when you have young children, you want to respect your parents while also staying true to Orthodoxy. So, sure. Sure. Um... It really depends on the situation. I can give some kind of general things. Life is so much easier for us when you're on the old calendar in a lot of ways. For real. Um, because you can still kind of participate in the civic secular holidays, which, you know, you don't need to tell your evangelical family that that's what they're doing. But, you know, um, and then you can really get into the deeper stuff, you know, on the on the church calendar. Uh, hence like the activities on um you know july 7th whatever uh, J- uh january 7th but um i would say there's some common mistakes that we many of us make and that is you know um let me tell you something about apologetics and that is apologetics are never there for you to feel better for you to feel right for you to um, condemn someone it's never that and if you're using it for that that's not what apologetics is there apologetics is always there for the love the benefit um, and if god wills you know the the salvation of the person you're speaking with father I, i'm so sorry what are apologetics so um apologetics essentially is the practice of um, the engagement over theological, uh, spiritual, and religious um, topics for the sake of um, illuminating, bringing someone to to truth. Okay. Okay. Um, so having a, having a right answer, you know. Having a right it's answer. All, it's also presented as like defending the faith by many people, defending right? Is that co- is that correct? Is that a correct yeah, orientation? That's a great that's a great way to, to put it. Defending the faith, um, and so apologetics are great if you have a right spirit about it. But the problem is, is so many people have the wrong spirit about it. You know, heretic, so I, heretic, heretic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, take for instance your family; they're not heretics because they're not in the church. So. You know, heretics are people who are within the church and are resisting the correction from the church on their error. That's what a heretic is. Um, so I think that keeping in mind, you know, have, you know, seven parts prayer, three parts conversation. Yeah. You know, if there's something that if there's a particular thing your family's upset about or whatever, you know, St. Isaac the Syrian, he says, I've never regretted my silence. <laughs> and the thing is, is, you know, there's a temptation to pride for you to feel like you're Paul the Apostle or that you're, you know, Mark of Ephesus and that you need to defend orthodoxy and it won't hold up. And really, you just don't look like a fool. That's it. And we all understand it, you know, but the thing is, is there's something to be said for being able to just be humble. I'd like to share a story if I can. No, um, we got to move on. I'm just kidding. Okay. But, no, I'm just kidding, Father. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, part of my conversion story was um, I, this This is actually interesting if he ever hears this, but um, there's this wonderful uh, couple, um, the Sullivans, and um, we had a friend in common, um, Steve, our friend Steve, and he invited us over and, you know, we were evangelical, Steve evangelical, and the Sullivans were recent converts. And so, you know, he invited us over and Steve's like, hey, I want you to meet these family. They're great people, you know, and kind of like low key, 
you know, maybe you could talk to him because he's recently converted to Catholicism. And I think, you know, you could maybe help kind of help, help him out of his error. Wow. Com completely. Yeah. So long story short, we show up and it's just wonderful. And it was a life changing thing for me because number one, some have heard of me tell my encounter of the icon and that was kind of like this direct way to orthodoxy. Well, this was in many ways the primer because in that, um, in their house, they were living in the rectory of this parish, this Catholic parish. And they had, you know, um, that's where I started. They had this catalog um, for Byzantine icons. They were like Catholic, like Eastern Byzantine. But like, anyways, I first was like, wow, this is kind of cool. You know, it was a catalog. Anyways, so we start talking about stuff. And I remember great evening, good quote unquote fellowship, whatever. And then, you know, kind of Steve gives me the nod, like, hey, kind of like, let's get into it, whatever. So we start talking. And, you know, I'm kind of hitting on the points, well, soul scripture uh, and all this stuff, right? And there comes a point where I said something, I can't remember how I phrased it. And um, Mike didn't really have an answer, per se. And he said, hold on one second. And he went up and he grabbed the catechism. And so the catechism, for those who don't know, um, the the Latins, they have this thing called the Catechism, which is basically their comprehensive catechism book. They're 101. On They're 101 on everything, right? So he goes upstairs, comes down, and he restarts reading from the Catechism on this answer to, like, give me an answer. And at first, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, you can't even answer for yourself. You need to go and get this book, blah, 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 you know. But, you know, the, the night goes on. It's amicable. It's great. And that movement was, it was like a suicide bomb. It like, it did something to me. I wasn't even aware of it. I was unsettled by him going and getting this thing and referring to authority. And, and it just, it was my first taste of a humility that I'd never experienced as a Protestant. Mm hmm and even even I encounter I engage that with in my own hubris. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you need to like have an answer for yourself. So, anyways, over the la over like days go out over like some days pass, and I'm just I'm really wrestling with with him doing that, and it it began to really turn something over in my heart, and it was a real crack in the wall. It was like a real crack in the wall for me to begin to really challenge protestant and evangelical kind of culture thought you know theology all that and um yeah at any rate you know stayed good friends with them they're a wonderful beautiful family and i really look to to his humility in doing that as a big god used that in a big way to help me in my conversion you know yeah that's that's um that is something that I just encountered not too long ago of a dude that was ab absolutely refusing to acknowledge any authority outside of a sola scriptura. He's like, it has to be sola scriptura. It can't be anything else. And I was like, bro, church didn't even have a Bible for a couple hundred years. Like, and those were some of those powerful saints. So what's going on with that? And he just wasn't hearing anything. And the moral of the story is at a certain point, because I wasn't even trying to debate him. He came in, he heard there was an Orthodox Christian where I, where I was, you know, at my work. And he's just, you know, he's a particular denomination of Christianity that die on a hill. I don't get, and that's the Sabbath. And I'm not going to name it. It's not a big deal, but like they, they just, yeah. yeah. But he came in and he was rearing to go at a certain point, like got to the point where I was like, where are the, where are the saints from your church? Where are the healings? Where are the paralytics being raised? Where are the incorrupt relics? Where is the holy oil? You know, where is that stuff? And he's like, well, you know, like miracles, you know, da, 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 da. And he's like in the Orthodox church, you know, like even Satan can. I was like, we're done. We're done. Because he was going to attribute some of this stuff to the devil. And I was like, we're done. We can't have this conversation anymore. You're about to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I can't be a part of this. I can't be culpable for your sin. I'm not going to engage in this conversation. I'm done. You know, talk later we can talk later but i'm done and i found that's been the most profitable way is like because some people just want to take down an orthodox christian you know and then there are times where you're just like yeah i don't want to really have this conversation right now like 
And that's sometimes the bigger move is to be like, look, I'm going to pray for you. And that'll be that. And, you know, um, you know, that's that. So, but the I guess I would say, so just being aware of that, we are engaging your family, you know, and you do not have to be the, the person with all the answers. In fact, sometimes, most times having humility and pointing them to the authority of the church can do more than you than you realize and be careful not to mistake people's it's a good thing to learn to when to listen and when to hear someone sometimes you have to hear sometimes you have to listen they're not the same you know and i find a lot of times those situation um sounds counter counterintuitive but a lot of times you just have to hear them, but don't really listen to what they're saying. Sure. Um, because they don't really know what they're saying, you know, um, and just hear them, you know, in the sense that like they can get some sense that you're acknowledging them and you're not trying to be difficult. Although oftentimes they'll interpret it as you being arrogant or something like that, but just know that you have to really put prayer, put the time in prayer and humility, you know, you got to water your prayer with humility you have to water your prayer with silence. Yeah. You know, you have to water your prayer with love and you'll learn to love your family um, in the difficulty of the sword of the tr the sword of Christ coming in between you and them. Um, you'll learn how to love them in a whole new way. Um, because the fact of the matter is, is we oftentimes, our love for others is contingent upon how we view our relation to them or what we're receiving from them. But when you really start kind of getting, you know, when, when the master says, don't presume I came to bring peace, but a sword, that's your opportunity to actually love your family in a way that goes beyond just the obligate, the obligation of biology, you know? So, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm drinking tea right now. So I'm a little bit hyped. I'm going to dial it back after this, but this is, this is important because father, what you just said is like, okay, so I work at a place and the parish that I go to, both of them, it would be easy to listen to a spirit of feeling excluded, like excluded, like, and like, yeah, that happens without a doubt. But like, one of the things that I actually use to combat that, and I think it's, it's actually really good is to like, try, you know, I guess to invert what I think I've been taught about social. So like, if I'm about social structure, so if I'm at coffee hour after church i'm hanging out with a group of people whatever blah 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 and um someone says something maybe like a little bit hard-hearted or insulting to me or something maybe they're just like jabbing me a little bit whatever but maybe it cuts like a little bit too deep or whatever the very first thing i try and do is i'm like okay can i gather up your plates like because like it's like this whole thing of like i have to be able to withstand this in a way that's christ-like so I have to be able to like, so what's the lowest I can go? Let's be a servant. So like, instead of taking the heat, instead of like getting really mad at this person and sitting there and fuming for the rest of the week about this thing that this person said, it's immediate. It was like, okay, it's time to go low. And like, then that like does this whole, like, well, how, how do I view friends? And it's like, you view friends like kind of vampirically. Like, what can I get from them? What's like, what kind of self-esteem can I make them laugh? And that gives me like a little self, like is, I get the little like button with the little hearts flying up, you know, like, what am I getting from that? And I'm getting like some kind of, it's vampiric, you know, instead of like a loving way of like, actually like, okay, no, I'm going to help you guys out. And it's an excellent way to combat that feeling because, you know. Well, the other thing too, forgive me, is that, I mean, the reality is it's not the people, it's within you. Yeah, without a doubt. Right. And so that's a great move in regards of engaging it the right way. And I, and that's, I mean, uh, it's tough because it really is simple. Every time we face a temptation, there's always a way out of it that's going to be God-pleasing. There, there's always, the Lord always leaves a way. But the thing is, we always we often don't want to take that take that path, and that's the reality, you know. And so, doing things like, you know, I think it's St. Patrick, right? You know, 
um, may I love instead of being loved. May I serve instead of being served. You know, oh, like, no, it's uh, St. Francis. Oh, is that Francis? Yeah, it's it's oh, the one good thing he did. It's, it's the still, one good. It's still good. You broken know? clock, broken clock. Yeah, twice. So, so yeah. that, I mean, like, that's, that's the thing, you know, so just engaging those things. So, yeah. Well, I think there's also, you know, there's this weird thing that happens with family and old friends when whenever you've made a change in your life um or just i mean just in at least i've i've dealt with this and i've talked with people well, that probably have dealt doesn't with receive this. honor in their own home yes that's it that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly it. that's that's exactly it and and and, and uh, what was the other one i mean look this is this is the thing for uh you know, you're never like if, if if you're a musician, DJ, performer, it's like you get you may be selling out. Uh oh. Did yeah. I did I disconnect? No, am I you now? am I back? You you're are back. breaking up a little bit. You're back now, but no, it's like if you you could be selling out stadiums, you know, a continent away, but when you play in your hometown, it's like you're playing in a small venue for like 200 people. Cause they've all, they know you, they've seen you yeah. play a thousand times. Yeah. They know it's yeah. not a big deal. Oh, he's played again. Okay. No big deal. You know what I mean? They yeah, we you know you. Up. We know your, exactly. we know your cousins. We know your brothers. Who are you? you know. And so I think that that's what makes being able to lean on the authority of the church and the church fathers. That's what makes it so mm. powerful. Is that it's like no 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 well they're actual stars, they're yeah, stars and, even in your home. You know? And forgive me, I, I just I want to reinforce something again. I don't want to beat it to death, but I'm just saying from experience, people don't really understand how powerful this becomes, because what they don't understand is that your family, your loved ones, and really the demons working through them, they want to engage on that level of your personhood. And so if you feed that, you're you're giving ammo to the enemy, right? But, and because you'll just test this, you know, those of you who are in this situation, just test it. The more that you disengage, and I don't mean disengage, like I don't talk about it, the more, but the more you like point to like, well, let, you know, I have this resource or here, come talk to my priest or talk to my godfather or here, here's this YouTube video. The more you defer, you know, here's, here, let me get you this book on patristic commentary. The more you defer to that, the more hot your family will get. You know, it'll be tough for them because, you know, they want to engage you because they can they can defeat you because they know you. But the more that you put put it to the church, the more that it, it's going to be tough for them. And then there, there's a critical mass that will begin to happen. But the trick with that is you got to be consistent because it's like if you're always... You shake the bottle and but you're like, tss, tss, tss. you know, if you're always letting it off, there isn't enough pressure built to kind of like get the explosion. Right. Sure. But if you just, if you have the discipline to be like, nope, nope, here's the fathers. Nope, nope. Here's the authority of the church, blah, blah, blah. You just, you be consistent in that. What you'll find is that gets to a point where they just can't stand it. And then it's just, you know, the breaker, you know, the fuse breaks or fuse trips and then then it's go time, you know? It's also a lot easier in such a situation for them to say, oh, dude, you know what? You were actually right Yeah. on this because you've never because you've never claimed that it was your idea in the mm -hmm. first place, right? So it's not even like that they're, that mm -hmm. they lower themselves to you in any way. Mm -hmm. you, you submitted yourself to the church. And so then it's very easy for them to be like, oh, no, you know. And it makes a way for them. More, yeah. yeah, it makes a way for them in because then it's like, you know, I've had people, I had people who didn't want to come into the church because they didn't want to seem like they were following me. I've had people say that. Uh -oh. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, we were interested in orthodoxy, but we didn't want to come in because we didn't look like we were following you, you know? And so that becomes a thing for people too. So being able to make a way to where it's like, it's not about you. You know what I mean? It's not about you defeated them in an argument or anything. Like yeah, that. that's just, important. You can just like, yeah, see, it's, and you can kind of like make the way together. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that, that's important. I mean, coming from it, I don't know if it's just my generation, but I can speak for my generation of like, people won't even listen to bands that I got into first oh, yeah. because they're like, he liked it first. Yeah. So there's no way I can like it now. 
And it's like, ah, okay, sure. And how much does that change the dynamic when you can go back to your person? Like, hey, I listened to that band you showed me and I loved it. And I've been listening to him all week. And like, I've had literally people like, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Let's talk about it. I'm like, yeah, they're awesome. I love them. They're incredible. Like yeah. father, you got me into Yob. And then like, or, uh, and then I was just like, Hey father, Yob is awesome. Like I never really checked them out before. And then like, you told me what album to listen to. I listened to it and you do the thing you always do. You're welcome. I'm like, <laughs> Hey father, Yob is awesome. I'm loving this. And you're like, you're welcome. That's the end. <laughs> okay. All right. No, it was cool. Like I like Yob. Um, so then moving on so this one is from a gentleman named taylor okay that's a long one i'm just going to remind you guys again i've said this before you guys don't get paid by the word so i'm just going to go i have questions dilemma that i would like father terrible to speak to sometime if possible we are orthodox christians in the oca my wife has kind of taken a left turn in the religion, political, social outlook in recent years. She's quite unhappy about the statement put out last summer at the All-American Council on homosexuality and transgender issues. She still believes homosexuality is a sin. Transgenderism, transgenderism for sure. However, she puts all the blame for the proliferation of these conditions on everything but the individuals. But everything puts all the uh, conditions on everything but the can individuals themselves, such as hormonal imbalances due to plastics, pesticides, et cetera, in our food and our water, also the society and pushing in general for pushing kids in that direction. Um, hold on one second. There's a little bit of fat I'm going to trim here. One second. Uh, that too. Okay, basically her argument is that to exclude one category of sin but not others is unacceptable. Uh, to a degree, I, I agree with her, but I don't believe the church is addressing these issues very well. But for myself, I do not blame our leaders as this is a very thorny and difficult issue. Uh, how do you love and accept the sinner while holding the line against sin? How can the church address the transgender without requiring them to be rever uh, reversing? Um, she considers the statement to be a political announcement as the church for traditional patriarchy. She has come to think that nearly all that is wrong with the USA is patriarchy as the underlying problem. So um, I can go through that again. There's a lot there's a lot there. I think basically what's the question though what's the question so there's this idea so his wife is taking kind of a left turn no I get that but what's the question so I think she's kind of like how do you love to accept the sinner while holding the line against the sin so the way you do it is you look towards repentance and so you recognize that um a person who has a certain has a struggle no matter what the struggle is that um, I think it's St. Nikolai uh, Zicha. He talks about when you see your brother in sin, you know, don't condemn them, but see them as being mauled by a tiger, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you recognize, you know, that they're being mauled by, you know, that they're being mauled. You recognize that they are um, diseased. Now, you know, you see someone with cancer, you see someone with some sort of disease, it's like you have pity, mercy, you want to help them, you want them to be healed and healthy. Now, the problem becomes um, his wife is is making the mistake of this. It's let, let's, let's get a little bit more specific to kind of help the analogy, right? Um, you have someone who has diabetes, and they're suffering from diabetes. Now, the person who's suffering from acute diabetes, who they've inherited it, and they're being responsible to the best that they can, you know, and they're struggling. You have mercy on them. You're like, man, you're like your heart goes to them, you know. But the person who's like that because you know they just want to drink cokes and eat candy, you know, and don't want to exercise. They don't want to take care of themselves. It's like when they start getting, you know chopped up piece by piece it's kind of hard to have sympathy for them sure right so repentance is the thing that helps kind of convert all of those sugars into something healthy versus you know unhealthy what, and weren't you talking about this with saint paul and colossians this last night when you're talking about that guy that was um having relations corinthians with corinthians, corinthians. Yeah. yeah so in in uh god bless you for bringing that up you know like Remember in the, the letter to the Corinthians, there's the man who was sleeping with his father's wife. And Paul was like, this is unheard of even among the pagans. Like, what is this, you know? 
But then he comes back around and he says, you know, those of you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, lest he, you know, fall into, into despair. So I think the key is, is that, you know, like my policy, my attitude is like, everyone's welcome in my parish. Um, transgender, gay, white supremacist, um, black alcoholic, supremacist. black supremacist, um, furry, like, <laughs> like whatever your gig is. Like, Can you're we draw a line at the furry? Can we draw? No, furs are welcome, man. <laughs> furs are welcome. You're, you're, you are literally welcome to my parish if you're, if you're wanting to repent. Because we, we are, we're all repenting to the best of our ability. And if you're struggling with repenting, but you, but you want help, that's what I'm here for, and I'll walk through hell with you. Now, that's if you want to repent. But if you want to come and you want to try to change the church, you want to bend the church to your, um your brokenness, well, that's a different story, right? Because none of us are doing that, you know? So I think the thing is, is that you have to understand um, the need for like um, this man and his wife. She needs to understand the need to really understand the issue apart from the social media that she's obviously engaged with. I mean, she's clearly you know, waist deep, at least if not neck deep in social media, clearly it's, it's really evident, you know? Um, and so I think just kind of like parsing through some of that and getting to the truth of it. And the fact of the matter is, is, you know, the church, if you begin to study the theology of the church um, and even contemporary, you know, fathers, they'll give you enough information of the theology of the church to help you really kind of see the truth behind these issues. And so how do we parse that out? You know, there's people who are repenting of these things. You know, um, there's people who have, you know, and I don't want to hear it because I've met them in person. You know, there's people who are repenting of transitioning. There's people who are repenting of, you know, everything you can think of. You know what I mean? I, I have, I don't, I don't want to be so absolute and say I've heard it all, but like, I've heard a lot. Mm. And so I've just, I've seen people repent of, of, of everything. So I think that's the key. And you have to recognize it's a real trap and a temptation to turn that into, you know, the idol, you know? Um, but these things, they are hurting those people. Like, yeah people who are engaged with who people who are um, and, and God help them the very, 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 and I'm just saying this to be charitable, the very few who might have some sort of crossed wires, some sort of, you know, um, uh, extreme example of fallen biology, you know, may God help them and, and God can and does help them if they want it. But the vast majority of people, it's, it's, it's not really what, what you think it is, you know, and I would say, well, I'll leave it at that. So. I, aren't we aren't we working like crossways against Christ as well? If we are lifting up the old man and you know saying, "Oh no, stay, stay that, yeah. stay that," like isn't that exactly against what we're called to do? Yeah, well, it's not. I mean, forgive me. It's exactly called against what we're supposed to do because that's not love. Mm -hmm. That's not love. And I think that's that's the other thing that his wife needs to understand, you know, and he should be, you know, continuing to pray because God will give these answers, but that's not love. And that's that's part of the discerning. I mean, that's what happened with, you know, if you love your neighbor, you'll you'll take this poison and do all these other things. You know what I mean? It's like that's not love. And, you know, it, it's interesting because this idea of and it's antichrist you know, humanitarianism is not Christian love. No. Because it, it's it's laced with vainglory, it's laced with man-pleasing, and it's laced with a materialist fallen perspective. You know, that the totality of man is found in his appetites. It's quite the opposite. Your identity is not found in your appetite. In fact, your appetites can often distort and do distort your identity. That's why they're called the passions. Because yeah. in many ways you become passive to that thing. So we actually, you know, I would submit that those quote unquote Orthodox Christians 
who are making these capitulations to this to these these um, these errors, they actually are are they actually do not do not love those people. They are actually participating in active destruction and hatred of the person of those people. I know it's a strong mm -hmm. word, but I'll stand by it. I'll die on that hill. I mean, it's like the the classic, if a person's running towards a cliff and you don't mm -hmm. stop them because you're afraid of yelling at them, you know, like <clears throat> that that's kind of on you a little yeah. bit. Well, I think I think in, in, in many of these cases, it's it's easy to see that the person wants to be renewed, right? Like, isn't that underneath? Like, it's an inversion of it, but it's like they want to cease to be who they are and to become something new right but they don't but but yeah. what they're being told like it's it's inverting christ no. yeah it's, i mean and it's it's funny because god addresses this in the book of deuteronomy <laughs> you know he talks about in deuteronomy really clearly and i think the thing is is that it's something that everyone deals with on some level everyone has some issue in regards of wanting something different than what they are or their what their station in life is everyone especially all of us modern people have experienced that but these people who are struggling with this extreme example it's just that it's such an extreme example of a very common reality unfortunately a lot of us are experiencing you know um so then he follows up by talking about she's really rallying against the patriarchy uh, we have a whole episode about that. I think it's number one or number two, something like that. Episode one or episode two. Number, it, number two. It was the first episode we recorded. But we released it. But we released it as number two. Yeah. So And it's yeah. it's a little bit rougher. We haven't got quite our stride yet. So just be prepared for that. But the, the It's still pretty good. I, I mean, gotta say, I think people should watch it. It's a, no, it was, I mean I think it was excellent. It's good in like um it definitely deals with the patriarchy where the where the um with that when that became a bad word, you know, like that kind of stuff. Um and you know it's interesting because like I was just talking with someone who um a guy at work who was talking about feminism and he was talking about like well, he's like, Well, Christ is a feminist. I was like, uh yeah i don't i don't see much scripture that supports that you what know did, what how did what did he say how did he back that up you know it was one of those conversations where i kind of was like i'm just it, this guy's kind of out there out. already so i'm kind of like i'm not really engaging him too much you know um because again i don't want to be culpable for anything he might say that might be blasphemous or weird so i kind of like i'm not really seeing a bunch um in scripture that really supports that um and actually like let's not talk about like the occult roots of feminism let's not talk about like it's like how is he even defining feminist like that's the right. thing too yeah. is like people yeah. throw it, words out like well, what do you mean by that you know i mean yeah and i mean like and you know he said something along the lines of you know like well you know i believe women should vote i'm like okay yeah, i guess i can get on board with that yeah i mean i mean i guess if that's the case then i'm a suffrage i'm a suffragette or i mean i'm, a, I'm in, in favor of suffrage so i mean i guess sure but like you know i think a woman should be allowed to drive a car you know that's, that's i mean stuff. equal rights under the law for men and women seems like a very christian ideal to me i think that's pretty much in line with scripture mm -hmm. well i mean that was something that father stephen DeYoung broke down is like feminism never ever gives credit where credit is due because a lot of the principles that they're drawing from are straight <laughs> from principle. christian of course from like old well, it, well here's the reason if they if they weren't it never would have been adopted as an ideology well yeah let's talk about the women's rights in the pagan world right where exactly you just None. be taken as sex slaves anytime that you wanted you know like you know like not to anyway but like um that I mean, the key thing, forgive me, I, I think the key thing I want to say, because I don't know if, what's his name? Oh, uh, the guy at my work? Kevin. Kevin. Is this Kevin still? No, 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 this is not yeah. Kevin. Oh, Taylor, the guy who Taylor. wrote the letter. Taylor. Yeah, I mean, oh, Taylor. you know, it'd be great if, if Taylor's wife wants to even kind of like chime in and engage a little bit more. Because when was this question asked? I mean, maybe she's come to some conclusions november i think of last year yeah maybe she's come to some conclusions since then you know because i like i would just say to her god bless you and 
totally understand where you're coming from, but um, I would just challenge you in the, in, the, in the most friendliest and loving of ways, just really kind of pull the earwig that's kind of whispering that in your ear, because uh, I'm submitting that's what it is, and get away from sources of you know opinion and information that aren't based in the church. Mm. And if you give the church the chance, if you treat your you know treat the church as your mother and honor her, give her the opportunity to answer based upon what she actually has to say versus what other others are saying she's going to say. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. And I, I think that, in fact, you'll find that your mother is not only charitable, but she's been a champion of, of the righteous and the good the whole time. So. I agree. And I mean, this is my last thing. I'll chime in, then we'll move on. That my wife was pretty much a riot girl when, you know, when I met her. Uh, well, shortly thereafter, totally smashed the patriarchy, you know, blah, 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 you know, whatever, listening to whatever. And through the course of anything, my biggest help has been, at least with her, of our repenting together has been my silence. When she brings that kind of stuff up, I'm just kind of like, you know, because she's looking for an argument. And if I, you know, and like I, I couldn't at the time then, but I can now probably to the degree quote the church fathers. And a lot of times it's just silence and just like, you know, I'm not really trying to talk about this. So. Um, this is an issue that I think we haven't talked about for a little while. But Elias, October 25th of last year. Again, I apologize. It's been so long. But Elias is wanting to talk about the stuff that we could probably wrap up the rest of the show with. We don't have to, but we could. Is He's talking about his particular love for uh, music. And uh, he goes on and on. He talks about it. It's a very well, but well-written email but i'm going to go out right with he's basically coming down to this he wants to go see iron maiden and he's talking about iron maiden he's kind of talking about specifically about like occult like imagery and like demonic quote-unquote stuff and music and we've touched on this before um but he then he talks about comic books so it's naturally it's like okay well i'm going to want to talk about that but um basically uh he's talked about um he, he appreciates the musicianship the powerful singing mythological and literary themes um the and I'm, he's just like a sucker for all that stuff and he talks about going to see iron maiden or i think he maybe he, he last week he went to an iron maiden show that's what it was and he's talking about how he didn't participate in certain songs because they sang specifically about like you know referencing the devil and asking the devil to do things and stuff like that but um I thought maybe we could kind of touch on this again because it's something that like I certainly struggled with during the early years of my orthodoxy and stuff. So um, I thought we could at least touch on that a little bit. Wait, is he asking a question or this is just a story? That he's he's kind of wanting our story. thoughts on the whole thing. Like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't convey that so well, but he's talking about the struggle he had with the show when he went to go see Iron Maiden. He's talking about his continued love of like heavy metal and extreme metal music and stuff like that. He's kind of struggling with it or not like this is kind of the right thing for him to be pursuing and everything. So all questions, I think anybody who is a metalhead or any kind of any in extreme music before coming to orthodoxy finds orthodoxy. I think these questions come up pretty quickly and they're pretty important or at least they were very important to me because music was such a large part of my identity and having to shed some of those bands was really difficult, ultimately very beneficial and looking back now, I don't really miss too many of them. At the time, it was really difficult to say goodbye to a couple of bands. But it ended up, I will say this, and then I'll be quiet. There was this one band I was trying very hard to listen to, and it just kept not sitting right with me. And it was getting to the point where I was starting to get kind of frantic in my head, trying to justify this, listening to this band. Um, and I eventually I called up a buddy of mine, who a uh, brother in the church that, you know, uh, I talked to him about it for a little while. And he's basically like, what does this band awaken in you? Like, why are you listening to them? Like, if they're if they're causing you this much conflict to the point where you're reaching out to me, why are you listening to them still? That like, right there. Yeah. No, it was. It, like, I that, stopped but that's listening. That dude's, but that's that dude's email too. Yes. Right. Like, I think he's looking for because I've been like, people have asked me about like, and I'm no who who am I? But just like people in my circle who are inquiring about orthodoxy and stuff, right? That they'll reach out to me like, oh, you know, I wanted your thoughts on this. And it's the same sort of thing that it's like, if it's causing you, you already know. 
Like if it's causing you conflict, I th- they want somebody to be like, they want a priest or something to be like, you may not listen to Iron Maiden. And it's like, or, or they want someone a priest to say, or you yeah, may. don't worry about it. Don't worry yeah. about it. You know? Right. And I had a priest do that to me and it still didn't feel right. I still was like, no, it's just not right. Well, then you didn't need the priest. Yeah. Or there's kind of, you a didn't need the priest, priest then. But yeah. Yeah. I would just say, well, no, or you just didn't, you just didn't need him. Like there was, like you already knew. No, you know, 100%. If it doesn't feel right, yeah. it's like, there you go, you know? Yeah, I would just say, you know, we can almost move to another one because it's, we, I mean, the Tavis Scott episode tackled this a lot too, but I would just say um, it's just like you guys were commenting. It's really about listening to your heart. I mean, and that's, if you want, if you're going to be orthodox, like actually like, We'd like to try to talk about actually being orthodox, not just kind of like punching a time card. If you're actually going to be orthodox, you have to learn to listen to your heart. Yeah. And that's the whole purpose of having a prayer rule and confession and obedience to the priest and uh, all that stuff is you have to listen to your heart. And if you go shopping around for someone, which people do all the time, don't do that. You know, like I've shared before, you know, you really again this god bless you guys like listen do not go shopping around for priests like i've talked to all these priests don't do that don't don't go find a bunch of priests to try to like find because what you're doing is you're looking for someone to give you the answer that you want yeah you know what i mean if you're really listening to your heart and you can just say god i'm gonna go talk to father jim bob and whatever he says i'm gonna take it from you that's more faith than trying to find, you know, Father Sergei, who has the perfect beard and ponytail and does all the stuff to make, you know what I mean? Like sure. those, or Father whoever. Sure, <laughs> like, it doesn't yeah. matter what the thing is. Like, that's, you, you don't need to find that thing because it, it's, it's Christ and the priesthood, it's Christ's priesthood. So I just want to encourage people to listen to their hearts because that's if you're not doing that then why are you praying then why are you doing anything and what what is worth the peace of christ what is worth being able to hear from god what is worth being able to move past your passions and grow in virtue that's all you know what i mean because you can find someone who they can't listen to iron maiden and their conscience isn't bothered Mm-hmm. But like you, you know, it's like we say during speaking of Lent during fasting, keep your eyes on your own plate. Yes. So. Yeah, and I mean, well, it's... here's 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 something interesting, Andrew, and maybe that's that's it about the conscience being bothered, right? And it goes back, I think, to the question before about and and about like the old man is mm-hmm. like, if you're listening to something where before not only was your conscience not bothered, but you were incredibly drawn to it, and now after your conversion and in repentance, your conscience is bothered. Better listen. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Like you don't need anything else. Like that's the message. There's your sign. That's it. That's the answer. You that's better it. Listen. And I can I can tell you from personal experience, a lot of those sacrifices that's extremely hard at the time. And there's occasionally a pang, but it it took me remarkably a little amount of time for me to not really because by the end it was torturous. It was torturous to not follow what was going on inside me. It was a torturous for me to not, you know, I was killing myself over like the constant debating, the constant needing to justify the constant need to like, it's okay to listen to this. And like, I mean, I'm just saying, for what it's worth, I asked God specifically, when I gave up uh, essentially like technical death metal and death metal and stuff like that, lifelong fans of this stuff um, that I asked him to give me new music. I asked him like, please show me some new stuff to listen to, you know, according to your will. And instantly I found three artists. Well, I didn't find whatever. I started listening to three artists that are now still part of my mainstay, like within two weeks, within two weeks, I got into like three new artists and to this day, they're like some of my most influential music I still listen to. And it, it was like, it was really obvious that like, yeah, it's just time to move on. You know, you're a father, you know, like um, 
you're actively like coming to come home you can't like listen to Meshuggah all day long anymore and I still listen to Meshuggah but like you can't just like pound out to bleed and then go home and be a patient kind gentle man you're going to come home and bring an energy that like your family may not be ready for and it's not even the content itself this is the last thing I'll say there's not even the content itself because father Sarah from Rose had to stop listening to classical music which is like because of his love for it you know it was so important to him he had kind of had to like I got to stop doing this and, you know, anybody who's thinking of giving up like an extreme form of music, like metal or punk, or whatever, like, okay, well, I'll try classic. It's not even really like the content of the music. It's your love for it and like, you know, your idol worship of it. So it's good. Well, and it's often a soundtrack for like, it's a soundtrack for the old us. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So it's like, that That's what it really was for me. Right. Is that like the music that I've given up since my conversion was like, the biggest aspect of it was that it was, it permeated my world and like put me into, it was my soundtrack and it put me into my character. You know what I mean? This character that I was inhabiting and yeah, it was, it was an incredibly big part of it. And it's like, still, if I throw that stuff on, I could feel it. I could feel it come back. I could feel that character, like try to creep through. And that's what it's there for. So you exactly. can't get mad about the, the music exactly. doing what it's supposed to do. You know? Exactly. So I, that's, you know, and I, I I mean, I guess that's one of the hardest things too is there's these things that our society is so built on with like nostalgia and stuff like that. It's it's hard to really see it for what it is and begin to wing yourself off and let it go. Um, oh, yeah, nostal- nostalgia. Nostalgia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, you know, I found myself struggling with that, Father. Yeah. Interestingly, that you bring that up, like I found myself catching myself. You know, thinking well, being, about yeah, it's yeah, weird. It's oh, being it's tempted weird from be- it's being tempted from behind, and so I think mm. that's you know that's another thing too that it's kind of like a it's you know it's, it's one of these logies me that's like on a on a bigger scale it's not just a personal one it's like a cultural generational one because um you know people um this is where you get all these like these weird man baby phenomena and stuff like that it's just yeah. it's really distorted and weird you know so. well i found it's I, I i recently it's interesting because i recently like within the last couple of months there was a week probably about a week it was during the fast, right? But there was a week where this thought, and I really, I recognized it as likely a Logos me, right? But it was like, is this, I prayed on it a lot because there was this thought that was like, maybe it was around the time, I think it was right around when Andrew Tate got arrested. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's, that's when it came. I think that triggered something in me, mm-hmm. right? Because of this former identity of mine. And it was like, this thought came where it's like, there's all of these incredible, like what people would think of like insanely incredible and unique stories or whatever, that this person that I was, that these things happen, that no one knows about, that I've never talked about, never done anything. And I don't know, some, a thought entered. And now I definitely know that it was a temptation from behind, like, because I dealt with it for a week. And at a certain point I was like, this isn't, what is this? This isn't, is it me? This is crazy. Right. But it was like, you know, this thought of like, oh, you know, and not even to do it now, but like, you know, someday you really probably should write your memoirs Mm. about this. And the thought it's weird because the phrase that came up, and I think that this was, this was not the Logos me. This was like the phrase that kept coming up in prayer was you're being haunted Mm. by this person. There's, Mm -hmm. there's this person who you, this character that you used to be, who is this, this suit, or Mm -hmm. it's like an empty costume that is now haunting you, walking around, like haunting you, like, put me back on, put me back on, put me back on. And it was just so interesting to observe and see, but looking around, it's like, that's, that would be a normal thing to do. Yeah. I think for most people, they would be you like, question it. They no have... question. Like, oh, yeah, of course I'm going to write my memoirs. Yeah. Of course. No question. Everybody should know this. And I was like, actually, nobody should be infected with this virus. 
God forbid. Yeah. God forbid some young man was to read this the same way that I was when I read Iceberg Slim. I and mean, to think to myself, oh, I want to be that. You know what I mean? Well, I don't know. Forgive me, because Andrew might have something else. I just want to say this thing is that in a in a peculiar way, this is one of the threads in the tapestry of porn addiction. You know of what, sorry? Absolutely. It's a tapestry and what? Sorry, Father. It's a thread in the tapestry of porn addiction. It's one oh, of the sure. threads, you know, and um, and it's 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 similar and it shares a similar, um, you know, kind of wavelength as other temptations in regards of trying to f- catch that first high, you know, um, but this fantasy and this delusion that that you know people will get when they engage in pornography and things like that, you know, it's, they don't realize it, but there's a real aspect of this in regards of the kind of vicarious nature of the voyeurism and things like that. It's just, it's one thread. There's way more to it, obviously, but like there, there is this aspect of kind of like thinking back on this, you know, some sort of experience and it haunting them and haunting them and the spectacle that surrounds it, you know, and the engagement of it, you know, so. So I'm going to send, I'm going to send us home. Uh, So this question comes from Drew. He said many other very, very kind things, um, but this is his question. Um, uh, I'm going to make sure that this is just his only question. Okay. I'm going to try and be better about this next time we do this and actually have some picked aside and the question set apart. Um, Drew or Andrew, I think, uh, good name. Like many of you, I have a tattoo and it's very meaningful to me, but the older I get and having discussions mm. with others and even my own teenage children, I'm feeling more convinced and convicted that act of getting a tattoo may in fact be mostly an act of vanity. I'm not interested in getting it removed. It's not vulgar, crass, or satanic in anything, but you can discuss. But can you discuss how deliberately scarring oneself permanently with ink for the sake of self-expression or the ritual or whatever is not an act of pride or vanity on a level? Yeah, how it how it is not or could not be. It is how it is not. That's yeah, it. I think that um, on the one hand. Obviously, there's in- intrinsic va- like vanity woven into it because um, any of us who are not Amish um, suffer from that. And I mean, even, you know, with the idea of, of religious garments like cassocks and habits, even, even people, monastics can even fall into the vanity of having a certain vest or a certain cassock or a certain hat or certain vestments or this or that, you know? Um, so vanity is something that vainglory is one of those things that are kind of the, the defect of, of the human soul. Um, so I think that on that level, it's there. I also think that, um, you know, your observation is, is accurate, um, but I would also qualify it in, in this sense um and it's hard because i don't know how i mean if he has teenage i don't know how old he would be but for some of us you know you have to understand that tattooing and tattoos are a very different thing now than they were even you know 30 years ago 20 years ago there's there's been a real a real shift in it um and the popularity of it has kind of revealed to some degree some of the inherent vanity of it. But for a lot of us who um, it was in many ways closer to how um, someone from a more kind of like, quote unquote, uh, primitive or indigenous culture, we would have experienced it closer to that as a tribal marking than uh, some sort of like unique personal expression. Um, I know that was my experience of it. That was the experience of, um, you know, the people that I um, not only, you know, kind of grew up with, but the people who even I was in the industry with um, in those early years, you know. Um, That's what it is here, by the way, forgive me, Father, but that's what 
that's what it is i mean that's how you see people with tattoos here like yeah the, the locals you know what i mean yeah yeah it's 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 a very 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 different thing you know um and so that's why it's kind of funny um because if if anyone kind of like pays attention not that you should but you'd be surprised how little on tattooing is out there regards of from me. Like, I don't, I don't talk about it. I don't engage people with it. You're not going to really find me. I, I've, I've made a point to not debate those things in regards to the church. And in fact, there's a gentleman who, um, you know, God bless him, you know, but there's, there's been times when people who have come to the church and I, I've tried to encourage them to like, just shut up about like the tattoo thing, you know, because it's, it's not, it's not something that you want to, it's not a hill you want to die on. And it's something that you're getting into an area of something that people just don't understand. And I think that um, the reality of it is that, yes, there is a lot of vanity in it, but I think that that's, the context that most people have experienced of getting it in the first place. Um, and those of those of us who didn't necessarily kind of experience it in that way, there's a whole nother kind of set of temptations with it, you know, of a more kind of cultic nature, things like that. But um, all that being said, you know, um, I would say that there's plenty of people who have, have experienced um, getting a tattoo in such a way it's like anything else it, it has encouraged them it has helped them to focus on certain things some people have gotten it out of repentance you know and there's plenty of people who have gotten it for just vain reasons grotesque reasons all those all those things you know are there um, but to just kind of put a period on it how could it be in a, in, in a non-vain way that's how when someone um, does engage in it in a in a truly like religious context, you know, pilgrimage tattoos. There's all kinds of historical precedent for it. Crusaders getting tattoos, and you know, there's whole cultures, you know, that um, it was it was part of their culture. So, I mean, wouldn't that be a distinctly Western problem? Is the idea of like that not even being revered as a possible like religious act? It's all strictly vanity. It's all like the mere fact that like I could see and I can see. I see what you're saying. Um, but like uh, or what Andrew's saying, but like the mere fact that it's so far from its roots, because I mean, I was sitting here thinking as you were talking, like how many D bags, and I truly mean D bags, like, ooh, I'm gonna take that back. How many people maybe got into a certain scene in the mid 2000s and got a koi fish tattooed on them? You know, like, I mean, like, and it was suddenly all the friends I had had a koi fish tattooed on them. And I was like, so this seems oh, like and they weren't they weren't Yakuza. <laughs> oh, no. Well, let me say most of them weren't Yakuza. I mean, we all have our one Yakuza friend, but like that most of those guys or they got like a spider web tattoo on their elbow or a third eye because well, i would say this look look I, I would just say this you have to understand that people like we have to be careful because people like what they like and that and that's fine but i i think the key thing here is to really um recognize that people kind of getting back to the question about music you have to listen to your heart you know like, why are you doing this thing? Why are you, why are you getting this thing? And so we don't need to devolve into whatever because um, people people choose to get what they're going to get, and that's fine. But I just think that the the question in of itself is, a, is, is an okay one insofar as, like, on the one hand, it's something that's very prevalent in our culture. Um, and what, what, how are we to understand that? And I would say... And I've always maintained this, people would be surprised how many people I've told to not get tattooed, you know? Um, so I just think that the context in regards to spiritual life is like everything. It's, it's everything, you know? And so we don't need to devolve into all the other stuff.
No, no, no. I mean, no. The, lest, the, we would, to, to, lest we would to, offend someone unnecessarily. Well, yeah. That's and what I word. what I was trying to say, I, Cyprian, I'm sorry, because I got to walk myself back. What I was trying to say was, you are not a D bag because you got a koi fish tattoo. I could, and I will, maybe next episode, talk about all the stupid things I did because I was following a trend. Like, that is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is all the people who got a koi fish tattooed on them or whatever or the elbow with the spider web not knowing what it meant not having really understanding of what it was it was more of like a fashion accessory and so the fact that it was a fashion accessory kind of speaks to the fact of like what we how we were starting to see the act of tattooing rather than what it actually is or what it potentially could be again if you have a koi fish tattoo tattoo on you that's fine like that's not what i'm talking about i was talking about people who like would get it because it looked cool and like i certainly have my tattoos that i got because i thought that they would look cool and do i still love all of them no but the fact of the matter is it's like at a certain point like i did something out of a it didn't even cross my mind that this could be like a spiritual or religious act it was no i want my right arm to look this way so i decided to tattoo it that way so well like, I can I mean I can I can draw this to something more like um you know it's the it's the difference between like you know our our cross and like I have a I have a diamond a, a diamond covered Jesus piece. You know what I mean? A platinum diamond covered Jesus piece from sure. a certain time in my life. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would never wear I would All never I, but this is what I'm saying, right? I would never wear that now. Like, that's just something that maybe in the future, like, my kids can sell if they ever get into, like, you know, a, a tough situation. Yeah. But it's just, like, I would never wear that now because, yeah. like, that does, like, that's not even a cross for a Christian. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's not even a Christian cross. It's a cross on a necklace. Right. You know what I mean? And it's like, well, but a cross on a necklace is a Christian. And it's like, no, that is not Christian. That that was not gotten in the context of my membership in the church, or even my identification at, with with Christ or Christianity, even more broadly. That was purely there so that it could just bling, as I walked around showing people like outside of my shirt, right? Man. And it's like I think that that's the, we can take it to anything. Like yeah. like it doesn't just have to be tattoos. It's like what was my intention and what was my intention behind that display. Right. It's not the same as like if this cry, if I'm leaning forward and this cross happens to fall out of the front of my shirt, it's totally different. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, it, it, it's just it's the nature of the thing because it isn't. I mean, the vanity of it, or at least I could say the inherent vanity in the contemporary motivation of it. You see it like this, like. When I was getting involved with the culture, it's like you did everything that could be um, hidden first, you know? And like people, like they call them job stoppers. Like you did not get your hands tattooed. You did not get your neck tattooed. You definitely didn't do things like your face and stuff like that. And now the common thing is like Post Malone and all these people is just like, I see it all the time. I just, it's like, I don't even shake my head anymore. Like you see kids like hands tattooed, their necks tattooed. They have nothing on their arms. They have nothing on their torsos. Have, it's just, it's literally to make it as visible as possible so that you could, you know, for all the wrong reasons, you know? And so like, that's a problem. And I, I think, I think, you know, like kind of like what Cyprian's getting at is they want to people on the other end, they want to make it a conversation about tattoos and it's like, like, okay, that's fine. We can do that. Cause like, sure. There's the permanent nature of it. There's the potential, weird interpretation of Leviticus 19 that people want to do. Like, I get all that. But at the end of the day, there's way too much historical stuff on the other end. And I don't mean like ancient stuff. I mean, even like relatively contemporary. No, Father, I'm saying it's right now. You can walk around yeah. this island and men in government with yeah. government jobs, elected officials have you know, Pacific tribal yeah. tattoo. They're yeah. Chamorro. They're Carolinian. Chimorro. Like, of course they do. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's what we... <laughs> so. So, like, so it's it's definitely the context we were talking about because, you know, the the stateside kid who's you know twenty three and just trying to look like he's tough or something like that's not. 
you know what I mean? We just got to be careful because that's why your analogy with like the cross, it's great because it's like for one person, it has some very deep cultural, spiritual meanings. And for someone else, it's just bling. You know what I mean? So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is what I was trying to kind of say, but who knows? I kind of forgot what I said already. But um, then I had, uh, is there any tattoos that you guys regret? Like you don't have to name them or anything like that if you don't want to. There's one specific one I, I regret that I was like, I don't know if I'd have it removed, but it's like, I ever come up to look at them like, eh, you know, I don't I, know. I have, I have none. Believe it or not, I never. Oh, you don't have any it. tattoos. No, oh, it's clean. There was, and, and let me, and let me tell you though, I have been refused. God bless them. I have been refused by like a handful of tattoo artists when I've gone on, gone in saying I wanted to get a tattoo. Um, and I don't know, maybe I wasn't fully sober, maybe whatever. And they were like, nah, I don't think you should get one. Yeah, that's good. That's good. good that's legit. Yeah. Like they're like, nah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that for you. Good for you. It's good. And they were all, good, all good decisions. I look back, they were all good. Decisions. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. I have a whole sleeve dedicated to a band I don't really listen to anymore. So, yeah. it's okay. I still like their artwork, and I'll listen to them every once in a while. But it's decapitated, a Polish death metal band that I don't really listen to anymore. Um. They're awesome. Like they're definitely without a doubt one of my all time favorite death metal bands, but it's just not, you know, it's just not me anymore. So that's that. So anyway, I think we're coming up on two hours. Um, something like that. Um hmm. Hmm. What did you guys break fast with? Uh not not the meal, not the after service meal father but like what did you purposely go out and get as a way of like i uh, reintroducing the the fleshy the fleshiness back to your life uh i haven't done that yet i mean like i made a hamburger for my family yep, that's what it night, was. you know yep. hamburger I had some pork jowls Ooh. you know I've been doing some of that. So I haven't really I haven't really gotten into it yet, you know. Um what was yours, Andrew? Man, I it was at the church meal, but I specifically made fried chicken Ooh, and set aside a couple pieces. I have not had that yet. Father and Papati and myself. And then a couple other people ended up eating some of it too. But in some of this spicy sauce, this po boy sauce that Connie made. It was just Dip the chicken. I'm, ha in. I'm having that for lunch tomorrow. Thank you, good. Andrew. Thank yeah. You. That was I, for the first time, I used Crisco instead of vegetable oil to fry it. Oh, yeah. that's yeah. the way to go. I will say the one thing I will say is it was a kind of a rushed, crazy night, and I made it that night. The batter, the the fry itself, like the the fried and the fried chicken, was not as flavorful as I wanted it to be. It was a little bit bland, yeah. and it was a little bit overdone. Did you a, salt the chicken, by the way? I did. I did. I did. We were asking about that. We were wondering if you had salted or seasoned the chicken. Before. Was it good, Father? I'm not looking for a compliment. Was it? Was it passable? I, I mean, it was. It felt like I was like. I don't think he salted the chicken beforehand. No, I mm. maybe I didn't. I don't think he did. Mm. He did. No, I appreciated it because I was like, "Yeah, great, some fried chicken," but. I was like, I don't think he seasoned or salted it beforehand. It was a little bit, yeah. That was my problem is is because like I realized that the oil was way too hot, and I didn't, and so I panicked and breaded everything really, really quickly. And I think I put too much flour and everything. I don't think I seasoned the flour enough, like the actual like um, breading. And then I took the chicken. I I let it soak in buttermilk, but for not as long as I normally do. And I didn't. I don't think I. It kind of tastes like bland, like Walmart fried chicken. And it, it was good. It was fine, but it That's was like good. I appreciated it. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, but I'm it was always, like, I'm always. If you think that you've seasoned something enough, season a little bit more, a little more, a little more. You, you know why? Yeah. You know why? Because I've realized for holiday celebrations, my place is in the kitchen. Like I just, that's I just love being in the kitchen. I love cooking stuff for people. And when you put that extra bit, that extra bit mm -hmm. of butter, that extra salt, that extra paprika, whatever, it's love. Mm -hmm. It's it love. love. 
extra four to... four hours of marinating. Yeah, I mean, because it's love. Because it's like, no, I want this to be yummy. Like, I want this to be yeah. good. I want people to enjoy it when they eat. I don't want it to follow the recipe. If the recipe looks bland, I want it to be like good. And uh, so maybe I'll redo the fried chicken at some other time and actually take a little bit more time and love for it. So. And not while I'm fasting. Cooking while fasting sometimes can make things kind of weird. So make everything beforehand. So, okay, gentlemen. Um, so, okay, what are we doing here? Um, so we have a, I haven't updated it since our last episode, but we have a playlist on Spotify that we talk about all, that we put all the music we talk about on here. It's Royal Path, uh, Royal Path Podcast playlist, something like that on Spotify. It's certainly getting interesting. Um and uh jack for the thumbnails yes yes you are killing it this this last one was good but my favorite is still the one before that is the one with uh the i think it's like the elder the saint with demons surrounding and he's going anthony is that saint anthony okay yeah it's as that was my favorite so far i think um you're killing it thank you so much thank you for your labor of love i'm going to continue to Try to shout out to you as often as I can. Um, again, there are people who are corresponding with who I haven't responded to in a little while. I'm sorry. I hope to get back to you guys soon, very, very soon. Um, uh, so the donation drive for Mount Tabor officially ended on the 7th um, with Nativity. Again, we thanked you last episode. Our father did, and then we ended up doing it some more, but I'm going to do it one more time. Thank you so very much to everyone. And just a gentle, you know, just a gentle reminder. Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. For wow. Real. Wow. God bless you guys. Thank you. Yeah. It was incredible. Above and beyond um, uh, someone who we know that I'm not going to name, who's very closely associated with the church, was crying to my wife, talking about how much it meant that we did that and the support that they got from um, from the, the shout out on the episode and the support that you guys gave so you guys and gals gave so that's fantastic mm -hmm. thank you um and i'm just going to gently say that donate button that link i think that's still up you know i'm just going to say you know if you guys get a penance or something like that and you got to give some money to some a good cause that's a good cause um i firmly believe in it my kids will be going to that school um and uh other than that uh, if you want to reach out to us please andrew at royalpath.network um I'm getting better at getting back to you guys as quickly as I can. And then our store is royalpath.store. Uh, all proceeds go to our parish and one third to the guy who actually makes the stuff and everything like that. So we don't see a dime from it. Maybe father does by the way of the church, but that's not really important. Um, so if nothing else, I think that's it. Thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.